Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sheila Bauman, and I'm the events planner for Kitchener Public Library, and I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's event. Before we begin the program, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. As we gather, we are reminded that the library is situated on land that is the traditional home of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral people. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening this community. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here and reaffirm our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our community. At this time, I would like to introduce and then invite Kamal al Solai Lee to the screen, who will introduce tonight's 85 Queens special guest. Kamal is the author of the nationally best-selling memoir, Intolerable, a memoir of extremes, which won the 2013 Toronto Book Award and was a finalist for the CBC's Canada Reads, as well as a Hillary Weston Writers' Trust Prize for nonfiction. His second book, Brown, What Being Brown in the World Today Means to Everyone, was hailed as brilliant by the Wal Walrus Magazine and essential reading by Globe and Mail. A finalist for the Governor General's Literary Award for Nonfiction, as well as the Trillium Book Award, Brown won the Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for Political Writing. A two-time finalist for the National Magazine Awards, Kamal won a gold medal for his column in Sharp in 2019. He holds a PhD in English and is Director of the School of Journalism, Writing and Media at the University of British Columbia. Kitchener Library previously hosted Kamal for his book launch of Brown, and we look forward to welcoming him back for his latest book, Return, Why We Go Back to Where We Came From. Welcome, Kamal. Hello, Sheila. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank it's you for so, being here. Oh, my pleasure. It's so, go it's so good to be back in, 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 the, uh, in, in the Kitchener Public Library and in the Kitchener Waterloo area where I started my academic career. And, um, and here I am at the UBC as you, um, and it is sunny, bright afternoon. And I am gonna go dive right in and introduce our great uh, guest today. So uh, it gives me much. absolute pleasure to, to welcome uh, a wonderful writer, a great friend um, and, and, and a great voice, uh, Omar Moalem. For those who, who do not know Omar, he's an award-winning writer and filmmaker. His journalism has appeared in The Guardian, The New Yorker, Rolling Stone, McLean's, Wired, and many, many more. Um, he co-authored the national bestseller in Inside the Inferno, a firefighter's story of the brotherhood that saved Fort McMurray, and co-directed co Digging in the Dirt, a documentary about mental health in the, in the Alberta oil patch. Um, he is also the founder of the Pandemic University School of Writing. Um, and he is also, it's not in his bio, but he's also the director of a, of a much uh, criti critically acclaimed uh, documentary, The Last Baron. And I know he's working on expanding it into a feature length uh, film. Uh, he lives in Edmonton uh, with his family. And it gives me a great pleasure to, work, to welcome Omar. Come on in, Omar. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you so much for, for hosting me. It is uh, such a great honor to, uh, to have you host this. Uh, thank you. Have thank you host you. the second stop on my virtual book on tour. The virtual, we're, all, we're all doing virtual <laughs> tours, my friend. Um, so, Omar, maybe what a before... time to be alive. Exactly. exactly. Barely. So, <laughs> diminished lives, but we're alive. Um, Omar, before we go any further with our conversation, I would love if you could just um, give us a reading from the book. Uh, I would love to read. I, I go ahead. rarely get this this honor um, as a as a journalist, uh, so this is this is quite a pleasure. So um, <clears throat> my book, uh, as you know, is a uh, travelogue through history through uh, thirteen remarkable mosques in the Americas, and I'm going to read uh, from my chapter about the Quebec City Grand Mosque. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> We can start Ayman Darbali's story in January 2001 on the day he arrived at Laval from Tunisia, or go back a little further to that coffee shop on the North African coast where Darbali's friend urged him to pursue his MBA in Canada instead of France as planned. 
We could begin with his childhood amid a destabilizing nation or on his birthday amid a hopeful economic boom, or we can begin in 1881 with the French invasion of Tunisia, a tiny wedge of the Maghreb, the place of sunsets that introduced the common language of another colonized land that would siphon the brightest minds of the Maghreb a century later. But I'll, do, but I'll dare go back another four centuries to the year the Spanish court upended the Maghreb with Moorish refugees and the Americas with discovery. It may sound tangential, but the conquest of Granada, the last holdout of Muslim ruled Europe, set in motion the white Christian supremacist theology that centuries later resulted in a mass shooting that paralyzed him from the chest down. That deep-rooted racism was exactly what Durbali hoped to avoid when he applied to Laval University against his father's wishes for him to study closer to home. Durbali didn't know much about Canadian society, but he knew what to expect as a North African in France. Shunned, stigmatized, and vilified for living segregated lives. The irony is that many live segregated lives in France and elsewhere to avoid discrimination. Have you changed your opinion of Canada as a tolerant society, I asked. Durbali delicately lifted a water bottle from his wheelchair tray with his thumb through an attached rubber band, sucked on the nozzle, and slowly set it back in the cup holder. I almost missed it, but he shook his head no. Looking at me through glasses midway down his nose, he explained, this attack could happen anywhere in the world. It could happen in France. It could happen in Tunisia. There's no safe place in the world. The difference, Durbali said, was that only in Canada would there be such national solidarity against racism. Since the attack, the now unemployed IT specialist rediscovered his purpose in anti-hate advocacy. He's a frequent guest speaker in college classrooms to discuss the nature of hate crimes and sometimes debates the difference between free speech and hate speech. But the most satisfying work is at high school conferences or wherever he finds a Muslim audience that he can encourage to take up civic participation. If we want to, if we want to protect our children from hate crimes, he said softly, we have to be engaged in society. You have to forget about the idea of Muslim services. We have to be a more active community. Durbali then requested we pause a few minutes so he could get in his duhr prayer in before the afternoon window closed on it. He did not excuse himself from the room or unravel a prayer rug. He stayed within three feet of me and adjusted his motorized wheelchair 10 degrees to his right with his toggle toward Mecca. Paralyzed from chest down, Durbali used the strength of his shoulders to lift his twig-like hands as close to his ears as he could get them, beckoned God with Allahu Akbar, and then let them drop onto his stomach. I watched him improvise the prescribed movements of prayer. Stand, bow, stand, prostrate, sit, prostrate, stand again. He felt these motions in his muscles as he hunched his neck instead of bending forward and the faintest pressure on his fingers as he spread, spread his hands a few inches apart in place of pressing them onto a rug. He raised his right index finger slowly, declaring his oneness with God and the oneness of God, exactly as he had tens of thousands of times in his 42 years. Watching a man worship like this, upright and face forward, felt too sacred and intimate. Part of me was unnerved by literally coming face to face with the religion I'd abandoned. Another part of me felt like I'd intruded on his private conversation with God. Most of all, I didn't believe I'd earned the privilege of seeing a grown man's naked vulnerability, his ego laid bare before me. But I had misread this moment as a feeble struggle instead of an act of defiance. So I'll leave it there. Thank you for that. Thank, thank you so much, Omar. That, that's in a book full of powerful and memorable encounters, that is one uh, that, that really sticks out for me. And I'm so glad you chose that. And it's with something we'll probably will return to to this part of the conversation, to this part of the book later on in our conversation. Let me just kind of uh, guide, guide the, our viewers here. And I, I believe that every book has an origin story. Um, and I'm just, I'm wondering if you can, if you can tell us uh, what is the moment in which the, you know, the, even the idea of the book, we're going to go from idea to execution shortly, but sure. maybe we can begin with the idea. I remember you and I talking about it yeah. in Edmonton about four years ago, and I remember telling you, don't tell a soul you're working on this book, because I, yeah, I don't want anyone to steal your idea. So maybe we can begin with that moment, yeah. if you don't mind. Well, so that was... Um... 
Yeah, I mean, I think that when I spoke with you, I was finally starting, the pieces were finally starting to come together at that point. But the origin of the book was, you know, quite nebulously, I felt like there was um, an urgent need to uh, do something to stem the uh, stem anti-Muslim hate. And, uh, you know, my, my journalism was not really focused on this, uh, you know, previous to 2000 and I'd say late 2015, sort of with the, the twilight of the Harper years of that very nasty uh, campaign, what I call the barbaric practices hotline campaign. Um, but I, you know, with, with that and with the rise of Trump and the Syrian refugee crisis and the rise of ISIS inspired attacks and the growing toxicity of social media, I just couldn't shake it. I couldn't get it out of my head. And it, it just kind of consumed the focus of uh, my thoughts, if not my writing. Um, so I, I knew that when the time came for me to write uh, my next book, it would have to be about this conversation. You know, part of that also was because as a, you know, as a teenager and as a young man, I had very, um, you know, very militantly uh, shaken off any, you know, Islam and any organized religion from, you know, from, from my being. And I became one of those uh, uh, outspoken, you know, militant uh, new atheists, if you will, you know, the ones that, that look for every opportunity to tell you uh, that they don't believe in God and there is no God. Um, and a lot of, I think that that anger was, uh, was maybe coming from a place of internalized racism, a place of just feeling like I was alienated and didn't belong, not necessarily because people made me feel that way. Certainly there was, you know, moments like that, but I think just, it came from this desire to be like everyone else. And so, you know, shaking off, uh, you know, my, my faith, like a, like a flaky old skin in the desert was just kind of my way of, uh, of, of appealing to, you know, for acceptance. Um, but in those, you know, in those years, the mid 2010s, it, it just, it, it was apparent to me that it, uh, you know, that it was impossible to shake off that most people saw me as a Muslim, that I was still was targeted in the way that a lot of Muslim, uh, Muslim males were. Um, and also that it didn't change the, the fact that there was a target on my family. Um, and I think a part of me also felt complicit in in uh, sort of modern American Islamophobia because a lot of the talking points that you would hear on the far right uh, were were similar to things that I had said or thought in the past. So this was in a way, uh, you know, uh, on the theme of of religion, this was sort of an act of atonement, if you will. Yeah. Uh, how it came to be a travel memoir? Well, I'm a travel writer, and it's kind of like, you know, uh, everything looking like a nail to a hammer, right? I mean, <laughs> but uh, you know, your book actually Brown was was part of the uh, you know inspiration to take that um, you know to take that approach. And uh, to actually go to the areas where the Islamic history was sort of hiding in place and to uh, excavate it from the land. And of course, along the way, I realized that it is not just, you know, buried in the past. It's part of the contemporary conversation as well, and that the communities that are there right now um, are still having a bit of a conversation with history. And so I wanted to know how those, uh, you know, how the history sort of shaped them, I think, and how it shaped their evolution as a, as a Muslim community. And so, you know, it just kept getting more layered and layered. And eventually it started to become more about the, uh, also about like just the, the rich diversity of Islam. And then also I felt a need to be more transparent, not just with my sources, but readers. And so it took on this element of memoir as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned, you mentioned the, you know, how you felt sort of compelled to take on this conversation, but I still, I still want to kind of uh, parse down that process. It's, you, there are different ways you could engage with this conversation about Islam and the, you know, the cultural, the specific moment in the mid 2010s that you're referring to. Um, at what point did you decide that, you know, structuring the book around a number of mosques, a number of different places in, in the Americas? I mean, I actually part of me wanted to ask you, like, why the Americas spe specifically? But maybe that's, uh, but it's me, we're getting into the weeds here. But, but I'm kind of curious, like, how does the idea become a road plan in a way, if you, yeah. can, if you can help me here? 
Well, um, you know, in, in looking for a way to, um, you know, to be a part of this conversation and try to stem the, the flow of Islamophobia, I decided that history was a good way to do that, because I think that history, understanding the context mm -hmm. of communities um, is, is in a way, it can be an antidote to hate mm -hmm. and fear and intolerance. And, um, you know, so at first I thought that I would just sort of, you know, try to capture that history, speak with a lot of scholars and academics and read a lot of books of scholarship and try to distill it into an accessible way. Um, but what I found was that the best historians were often lay people. They were congregants. They were the boards of directors or just, you know, the, the average, um, you know, worshiper at a mosque. And so, you know, after finding myself in uh, mosques for the first time, uh, you know, consistently in uh, in a very long time, you know, maybe since spending some summers in the Middle East, I hadn't been in that many mosques. Mm -hmm. um, I think I just kind of, uh, I started to, I, the, the mosque started to feel more like a character, I guess. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to, um, you know, I wanted to have a good, strong sort of framework scaffolding for this book. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, at uh, create a, a feeling of being, you know, in the present moment with me. And mosques are just such, such rich environments. Even the, the very humble, you know, sort of street facing, you know, uh, ones that you find, um, you know, in, in the middle of a plaza or something like mm -hmm. that can be, can be quite extraordinary uh, to be inside of. And also, in a way, they they can act like time portals for, for me as, as a literary technique, they can act as time portals where you can go into a mosque and from this setting, you can transport 400 years back in time, back to the present, another 200 years or 50 years, and you can keep coming back to it. And it just feels like, uh, it, it feels like you have uh, a more grounded, you know, place um, in this book as a as a as a reader. Certainly felt that way as a writer. Mm -hmm. and, and at what point do you decide which mosques, which places, which stories? Um, you know, as, as as a fellow nonfiction writer, I am I am fascinated with this idea of of process and and of the idea of the decisions you have to make. Um, because I mean, there's some editing that happens before you even send it to an editor, yes. um, and some decisions you have to make. Particularly, I'm 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 I'm, I'm sort of very interested in um, uh, maybe you, you can tell us more about the logistics of a book of this magnitude, where you travel to multiple countries and and several like several stops in Canada, several stops in the U.S. Um, and while you're obviously, a, you know, you're a father of two children and you have to make a living at the same time, I don't know, I, I know wow. from book writing that you don't make your living from, uh, from writing books and yeah. very few Canadian writers do. I, you know, I don't want to overwhelm you with that question. But... No, no, no. It's, uh, I can, I'll answer in, in probably a little bit of a, a scattered yeah. way because there's a, there's a bunch of different answers to this. Mm. Some of the mosques I knew immediately, these are places that I wanted to sort of center uh, the, the, the chapter on. Mm -hmm. So um, for, Isla for, for example, the uh, Islamic Center of America in Dearborn is, is a very famous mosque. At the time that it had opened, it was the largest one in North America. It is, I think, $17 million. Um, it was, you know, sort of envisioned as like the um, American, sort of like the Vatican of American Islam. Um, but at the time that I had started writing this book, I had gone through a very dramatic um, shakeup and transformation. And so for me, that that was just kind of obvious, a place like that. Other places, um, I didn't have much of a choice. I knew that I wanted to uh, give a lot of attention to uh, Black Muslims um, who, you know, for a long time were the, were the predominant Muslim population of, of the West. Um, and I wanted to uh, sort of capture the, the often lost, erased history of enslaved Muslim Africans. So the best place for that was Salvador, Brazil, um, <clears throat> because it, it, it is the home of this, this very famous uh, Muslim uh, rebellion uh, against slave masters. Um, quite extraordinary, and the amount of documentation around that event is there. 
But uh, as far as like the Muslim presence today, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny population and they really only have one mosque. So that's the mosque I'm gonna go to, to find out how the history and the present day population have like a conversation with them. Other mosques, you know, I, I sometimes stumbled onto them, uh, like quite literally the one in Inuvik, this was uh, very early on in the process of writing uh, or process of, of, I guess, this book uh, gestating. Um, I ended up in Inuvik on another assignment and I opened up a travel brochure and I saw that there was a mosque featured in the travel brochure, the Midnight Sun Mosque. Um, called, uh, you know, affectionately called the, the little mosque on the tundra. I'd never seen a mosque in a travel brochure outside of the Middle East before in my life, right? So I, you know, and I had this other trip planned, this other assignment, we got snowed out. I had a whole day to myself. I just thought I would go there and see what's, you know, what's cooking. And I found just an extraordinary uh, story um, that uh, of, of how the mosque came to be, but also met extraordinary people uh, at that very moment, I felt very lucky throughout this book. I often would stumble stumble into people's lives at these pretty, um, you know, pretty transformational moments, and they just wanted to open up to me because, you know, when you go to a mosque, when you go to a place of worship, you're going to find people who are spiritually, you know, seeking something. And so I just happened to find people who were in a, in sort of a pronounced moment of spiritualism, um, who wanted to, you know, talk to me about their relationship with their faith and their identity, how it's sort of flowed through time. Um, so, I mean, th that's just like a, a few of the examples. And, you know, oftentimes I would just find myself in a city uh, as a traveler and I would, uh, you know, go out of my way to, to do some research there. And sometimes I would find something for the book and sometimes I wouldn't. Sometimes I would return there uh, to do some more thorough research. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, <laughs> and, and sometimes a place like Trinidad, I think I probably went to a dozen mosques. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the one that I thought I was going to focus on kind of shifted as well. Uh, so yeah, it always I mean, happens. I mean, oh, you you speak to to people uh, pre-interview from you know through Skype or Zoom or whatever, but and then you arrive there and you meet more interesting people or you you know, oh people with different kind of histories that you gravitate to. And I know it's it's a it's constantly shifting goalposts when you write a book like this until until it's finally put together. But but you I mean something about writing the, the kind of book that you, you 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 have and the kind of book that i use as you know that i have it and and i myself you know sort of built uh, brown on books by michelle decentio and Teres gresco and doug saunders so it's like that idea of finding um uh, finding a sort of echoes of the idea of the central theme in different places um so much of it relies on i would say the kindness of strangers sometimes yeah. the kindness of people and, but also relationship building. And, and you know, more recently, um, there's been a lot of talk about how we as journalists deal with our sources and our relationship and ethical responsibility to sources. I don't always believe in the, you know, the journalist and the murder sort of model that was very popular in the 70s. I think there, there are ways you can actually um, take standards of care. And, and I, I just want you to talk a little bit about about the relationships that you've built along the way as you worked on the book. I mean, maybe, maybe backtrack a little and say, how do you, you said that most people were in a spiritual place and willing to talk to you, but some people were, I would say hostile, but suspicious yeah. of your, okay. um, of your uh, reason. So maybe kind of like, I, I feel like I've almost said how you get them from no to yes, but, uh, but also how you get them to sort of, to open up to you. Yeah, well, um... Yeah, there's a there's a lot going on there. So let me let me start with the um, with the easy one, which is the you know how do you open up to them? I think this kind of relates to what I said earlier, where I felt I needed to be a little bit more transparent with with my sources. Um, what I found is that I you know I wanted to go in there as a journalist and do my journalism thing, um, but of course, I mean I should have anticipated this, of course going into these places as, you know, as a, as a man named Omar, 
and who's interested in Islam and, and, and knows a, you know, a decent amount of, of the religion and, and the, um, you know, the, uh, the terminology can speak a little bit to the practices. I should have predicted, of course, that I would be sort of welcomed as a Muslim brother. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, expected to participate in, you know, communal worship. And so, you know, I felt I needed to be a lot more transparent with with my sources and tell them, you know, I, you know, I have a complicated relationship with my faith. I, I you know, I, I do want to, um, you know, participate in your, uh, you know, in in your salat, in your worship. Um, and, you know, here's where I'm where I'm coming from. And I would be I was willing to be a little bit more vulnerable with them about uh, some of the challenges that I've had with the faith and some of the journey that I'd made. And I think that kind of honesty, um, you know, that helped people trust me a lot more. Now, sometimes um, that, you know, sometimes that could that could backfire and I knew it would backfire. And so. I went in there not revealing too much about myself, trying very much to just uh, be sort of an objective reporter. An example of that would be the, um, the uh, much of the chapter in Trinidad where I met with um, you know leaders of uh, a militant group called Jamaat al-Muslimin that had pulled off uh, or tried to pull off a, a coup um, in uh, in the early 1990s. Um, and so there was, you know, there was a little bit of a, a, a tug of war there where, you know, I wanted to go in as like just an objective journalist, but the leader wanted me to pay a hundred dollar donation to his school and I wasn't about to like pay a, a bribe to a source. So, you know, I kind of put on, uh, I like I admit now and I, I admit it on the page, I, I think I put on a little bit of like a performance as like a, a fellow Muslim where I'd said, well, how about, you know, as sort of a act of zakat, um, I give, uh, you know, like a Muslim donation, though I kind of totally botched that definition. <laughs> how about I give that hundred dollars to a, to a charity, um, to an independent charity? And then, you know, he was like, zakat, that's not zakat. Are you sure you're Muslim? You're not Christian? And he also tried to like play me claiming that he had once been a CBC journalist. So there was, you know, in moments like that, uh, you know, what can I do? I mean, e even if I didn't get the interview, I felt like I got the story. Um, but, uh, you know, it, I, I, I think at the very least, what, what I can do in those moments is be transparent with my reader, at mm -hmm. least about, uh, you know, I know sometimes people call this journalisting, they don't want to see it on the page, but I felt like it was uh, on a topic this sensitive, it was important that I sometimes reveal how I got access. You know, if I, if it wasn't, you know, straightforward asking for an interview, getting an interview, I had to sort of be straightforward about how I got that. And that, that came, you know, there was a couple of right arounds in this, uh, communities that really did not want me to uh, profile them at all. Sometimes it often surprised me who wasn't that, uh, which communities didn't want to be profiled in this book about, you know, Muslim pluralism. Um, and sometimes that would become the story is, is I guess the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the hostility uh, toward, uh, you know, toward a journalist, um, or the the reluctance to even be, you know, included in this conversation about uh, Islamic pluralism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and you mentioned you, you threw in the I mean you mentioned the word objective reporter, and I, you know, just I, I, as part of the, the, your your answer, which kind of, um, and I'm not I'm not saying that uh, that that that's the model you worked with or anything, yeah, but yeah. Uh, but I, I I also wanted to know. Um, about, you, you know, you have skin in the game uh, when yeah, you write a book like this. I mean, it's, it, it is so close to the bone, yes. but you also, you are also bound by some of the rules of nonfiction and some of yes. the, or oh, some of the conventions, I should say, of nonfiction, some of the conventions of reporting and writing. And I mean, I, I mean, I struggle with that to some extent in Brown and, and, and because you are not, you, you, this is very much also your story in a way. I mean, we'll get back to that towards the end, to that towards the end, but but maybe kind of you can tell me about how you how you would reconcile 
Omar, who was second, third generation uh, Muslim born in Edmonton, um, with Omar Malam, the, the, you know, the book author and yeah. reporter and journalist, uh, National Magazine Award uh, winning journalist. And just, I mean, not that I see, not that I see it as a dichotomy, but I see it as very interesting tension. Well, yeah. Well, any, I think anyone who's, um, who's familiar with my literary journalism, uh, certainly over the last you know, decade knows that uh, first person journalism is a bit of my default and that I, um, you know, it's, my writing is not always confessional when I go that route, but I think it is, um, it's, I like to think it's vulnerable. I'm willing to, um, you know, I'm willing to air out my mistakes, uh, past and present, um, I'm, you know, I'm willing to kind of show, you know, show myself sometimes as, as a klutz, as a reporter, which, you know, which I do in this. Uh, but, you know, I still, I still want to at least do my best to maintain some sort of objectivity, even though I know it's in, it's, it's virtually impossible. And it's certainly impossible on something like this. That's, that's kind of close to the bone. At the same time, I think that um, being someone who is not is not like a a practicing Muslim gave me a little bit of distance. I didn't feel like I needed to protect the religion. Um, I did feel like I needed to, you know, try to, I guess protect vulnerable communities or people who are vulnerable from uh, from you know racism and hate. But the religion itself, I don't, you know, or any religion, I don't feel like it's, you know, it has to be handled with with uh, some some sanctimony. Um, and, you know, I know that's a very you know, haram thing to say, but that but that's how I feel. I think that we should be able to have a very honest conversation about uh, dogma, but maybe even more importantly, just how scripture and dogma gets interpreted into, you know, culture and, um, and uh, you know, it, it, in, in, into practice. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of what it was. It was, it was going in, uh, having both my, you know, my journalist hat on, but also being, um, I think, you know, have, showing that I uh, related to the subjects, to the topics, and just trying to find a balance between those those two things. And, and, and I mean, finding that balance is really, um, uh, I think it's where the book soars, in my opinion, because it is it is very much um, your book, but it's also gives it gives the readers. I mean, I remember when I was reading it way back in the summer, I believe this, this seems like another lifetime. I was still in Toronto at the time. Um, it was also um, an insight into a world that I knew relatively little about. I mean, as, as with the story of the rebellion in Trinidad, as with the black community in, in El Salvador, Brazil. Um, so I, 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 I kind of want to get into history a little bit with sure. you here. Um, because I think what you are what you are doing is unearthing history that that for some reason we has not been much more common or much more spoken about or, yeah. or well known. I'm I'm going to begin by asking you why is that history that particular history of of Islam in the Americas is so obscure or so little known or so little understood? I mean, in your research, did you as you were unearthing it, did you also unearth some reasons of why it, it remained um, unknown? There's, there's various reasons. <clears throat> I think, you know, just to begin with, like all, you know, most non-European, non-white histories of, uh, of people who've settled in the Americas is obscured. We are only now as Canadians starting to uh, in earnest um, unearth the indigenous history that's been, you know, available all this time, our entire lives, right? I mean, literally unearthing. I mean, we're talking about, um, you know, the bodies of, of children on, on the lands of residential schools, something that growing up in, in Northern Alberta near uh, Drusard Residential School, I had heard rumors about that and never thought 
to wonder beyond it as just a rumor. So, you know, I think just as sort of like a baseline, um, non-European, non-white uh, histories get obscured because, you know, the people who are powerful write the history books. Mm -hmm. um, they decide what is taught as history. Um, just recently, the new Alberta curriculum, as flawed and controversial as it is, has introduced um, as part of its curriculum um, some uh, some history on the Lebanese Muslim um, sort of pioneers who had established the first purpose-built mosque in Canada, the Al Rashid Mosque, which is mm -hmm. profiled in this book. Um, <clears throat> now. When it comes to Islam, uh, I think there is, though, something else that's going on um, or that that kind of occurred before any of us were alive, probably before our parents, maybe our grandparents was were alive, which was um, and you see it in 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 Brazil. Uh, and um, it was a and in the United States, it was a concentrated effort to uh, suppress the Islamic culture of enslaved Africans for various reasons, one of which was that they saw it as sort of competition with uh, Christianity. Other Black religions, you know, I wouldn't say they let them flourish, but they were somewhat more lenient on them. But Islam in the in this sort of collective psyche was uh, a lot more threatening. And so there was more of an effort to stamp it out. Um, and there, you know, the consequences of sort of expressing your Muslimhood for uh, enslaved and even, you know, freed black, uh, black people were just, they were, they were more severe. So there was more of an incentive to, um, to assimilate religiously. So I think that's, you know, that's another, I think that's another part of it. Um, and then I think another part of it is just, you know, kind of ambivalence. You know, and we are in a we're in a secular society, and I think our default is not to care too much about religious history. Um, we don't want it imposed on us, rightfully so. Um, I think that you know, in places like Quebec, especially where they have a very fraught relationship with um, with religious powers, there is a desire to um, just kind of push it into the background, not have to think about it. And when there are opportunities to learn about uh, you know religious history um, of our you know of the places we live, to just not really you know pursue those opportunities. Um, so I think those those are some of the reasons. I'm sure there are there are probably many more. Right, but but t t uh, like tell us uh, tell us a little bit about um, the, you know the very act of uh, of reclaiming that history. I mean, did you see yourself as um, uh, I mean, you, you you mentioned travel travel writing, but did you also see yourself as a sort of amateur historian in a way, or yeah. as a as a little bit of wanting to to sort of revive a certain past? You know, I, at the risk of sounding a little bit pompous, I, I, I feel like every, just about every time I have an assignment that is about uh, culture somehow, I have to be a bit of a, an amateur, you know, historian. Um, you know, you see, you see it in, in, in my, in my new documentary about, you know, about Burger Barons, this like fast food restaurant in, in Alberta with a, you know, with a, with a cult following and, and uh, that's become sort of part of this Lebanese tradition. It, you know, the, I don't even think about it. As soon as I want to tell a story about fast food joints, I need to get into the history of fast food joints. And of course, I find something that is absolutely, you know, integral to our current understanding. I've done that with, you know, articles about, say, you know, why uh, why millennials are not getting their driver's licenses at the same rate that uh, Gen Xers or Boomers did. Um, I want to go into the history of car culture. Um, so yeah, I mean, with but of course, with this, it was a lot more intentional because, you know, I going back to when the first seeds of uh, a book or a book like this appeared in my head um, as wanting to add to the conversation to stem the flow of Islamophobia, there's already a, a, a great collection of books and films uh, on this subject and art on this subject. I looked at the landscape and I felt like what's missing is the historical context of these mm -hmm. communities. And I knew personally what it did for me um, as a, you know, as a, as an Arab 
Muslimish person to know more about my own community's history when I learned that, say, my three of my four great grandfathers had uh, lived in the Americas, one had been part of, you know, the Saskatchewan uh, sort of early uh, 1900s homesteading community, one had worked in in Ford's car factories, I felt a lot more Canadian. I felt a lot more rooted in the land here. It was as if I could, learning that information sort of made my legs grow through the ground more. And so knowing what it did for me, I, I believe that this book can do that for other people from Muslim backgrounds who feel untethered to, to the land. I mean, always when I was reading your book, I remember if, if Samra Habibs had not taken the title, we've always been here, that could have also been a subtitle yes. of, yes. for your book. Like, damn, it's, it's a great too. Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, your book is really, among other things, it's about, it's not just that it is, uh, it, 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 it's a long and continuous history yes. that has not just shaped, uh, as, the, as the title, I'm just looking at your, the poster uh, behind you, it's just, it's not just shaped the, uh, the community, the Muslim, the, the Ummah, the Muslim, the, the larger Muslim community, but, but the America, but the politics and the conversations. And of course, nothing is more powerful than uh, an example of that than what happened in North America after 9-11. Yes. And how the conversation around um, not you know Muslims Islam itself has changed, and you yourself recognized 9/11 just before your 16th birthday, if I remember correctly, yeah, right. or 13, yeah, 13 yeah, or 16. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, you recognize it, and I recognize it as a kind of a before and after moment. Mm -hmm. uh, that that you know, I feel like the world tilted in that moment, and um, and I, I, you know, I just kind of want you to to, to you know maybe elaborate a little bit about what that day and what that moment uh, has done, both in your, in your progress as a, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a Canadian and, and in your evolution as a writer, perhaps. Oh, um, you know, I think every, every uh, person who was coming of age at the time of 9-11 and in the early years of the war on terror, uh, everyone that I know anyway, um, had to wrestle with their Muslim identity somehow. And most of the people that I know went in the direction, I think, of embracing it, protecting their religious heritage, even as they probably struggle still with the tenets of it and, um, and you know, and adhering to the, to the practices. Um, I think that they, you know, embraced embraced it to a large extent but there's also another sort of group of uh millennials um who came of age at that time that kind of got i think kind of tugged in the other direction of really wanting to distance themselves from their faith to sort of avoid any of the perceived possible harms that could come out of this moment and i certainly fell into that group um, what I found, though, that in the process of writing this book, um, the people from my group were, as you know, as we reach our, our late 20s, 30s, we're starting to find our way to the other group in some way, maybe not always um, through a dedicated practice to, uh, you know, Muslim, Muslim traditions, to Islamic rituals, though sometimes that more often just a, um, a, a, I guess a, a uh, unavoidable acknowledgement of relatability that, that uh, we, whether or not we, we sort of accept the dogma, we still are like you and that what hurts you also can hurt us. And I found, you know, a number of people who uh, said that, you know, they were starting to reclaim their faith in the in the wake of Donald Trump. This was more in the United States. In the wake of Trump, they were starting to reclaim their faith largely as an act of defiance, mm -hmm. um, not just against the Islamophobes who, you know, would would, you know, dare to try to um, uh, push them away from their religion, but also in the in the face of the the zealots, you know, the uh, the religious authorities in their lives 
who would tell them you're not Muslim enough. You know, you can't, you know, how you can't really claim a, a seat in the Ummah because of this, that, and the other. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, th I think that there's, there's a very interesting thing going on with Gen Z and millennial Muslims, where in the internet age, they are starting to form the conversation. Whereas I think for generations, Muslims in the West isolated from, from the East and where the, the sort of like Islamic powers are and the, the most religious authorities come from or are, um, for a long time, they've had to sort of rely on that authority to sort of define their Muslimness. But in the, in the internet age, and I think also just this being, uh, you know, millennials and Gen Z having this strain of uh, individualism and also activism and, um, and a desire to do what's right for this world are starting to um, take the conversation, like lead the conversation themselves. And they get to define uh, what makes them a Muslim not define what makes a Muslim, but what makes them one. I think that's perhaps you, you, yours. Just before the end of the book, your final stop in a way is Unity Mosque in Toronto, where, where um, it's uh, you know it's one of the most progressive uh, sort of Muslim spaces. Uh, I don't that, know if you could find a more progressive one. <laughs> well, in any religion, to be perfectly honest, yeah, I think it, yeah, it, it, it 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 has um, it has sort of it completely. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to get into the, the, what they're doing, but 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 it has sort of if if uh, it it's, has changed. It's turned. It's turned the sort of the the um, you know the the rituals or the the definition of what is uh, Friday worship kind mm -hmm. of on its head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and and the vocabulary around that and the practice around that as well. Um, I still have a couple of questions, but I, I, I am conscious of time. We have about 10 minutes and we have a few questions from the uh, from our viewers. So I'm just going to um, so I'm going to just read some of them uh, to you. Uh, we have one from Charlotte Kong here who's asking, though you're not a practicing Muslim, can you describe um, how your personal relationship or thoughts about atheism changed over the course of researching and writing this book, if or how your personal relationship has changed um, over the course of researching this book? Yeah, well, you know, I used to, I think I used to um, try to, uh, I, I used to identify, like it used to be a part of my identity, as opposed to just a way to sort of like um, uh, define or give some definition to my beliefs, some would say lack of beliefs, but it's a belief that, you know, there is no God, uh, that, you know, I think that I, I used to make that a, sort of central to my identity. And I think that's what made me so obnoxious as a young man. <laughs> um, and nowadays, I, I see it as um, maybe more of a adjective, you know, I, I do think that you can be an atheist Muslim. Um, not everyone would agree with that. I think maybe most people would disagree with that, and that is fine. But there's always been a place in the Ummah for people who may not necessarily believe uh, in any black and white terms the, uh, the Quran, but uh, draw from it inspiration, draw from it some meaning for life, for how to engage with the world, engage with our families, engage with other people. And there are practices that I cherish um, and that I have always cherished. The, you know, the fact that I've, you know, even though I hadn't gone to uh, mosques uh, for Friday prayer for a very long time before writing this book, the fact is I always cherish being in a mosque. I love the environment. I love uh, praying in unison with, with other brothers. I love at the end of prayer, looking over to my right and saying, peace be upon you and shaking a strange man's hands and looking to my left and, stranging, and, and change, uh, shaking a strange man's hands and saying, peace be upon you as well and to each other. Um, so, I mean, it's... It, it has shaped my values in a lot of ways. And in a lot of ways, I'm still figuring out, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, I think I just don't feel like I should have to purge it, um, that I should be able to reclaim at least, you know, parts of it as, as part of who I am, because they are. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I mean, among other things, it's just, it, some, in my in my opinion, sometimes we don't have a choice. I mean, it's in our faces, it's in our yeah, 
course. It's in our names. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so yes. That's when, you when I travel, yes, you know, when I travel, there have been, you know, I, I, I recount a couple of moments in this book where it, it really doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter what's inside my head because someone else is putting those, you know, beliefs in there for me. Right. So I think this kind of comes back to wanting to reclaim it as an act of defiance. It's like, okay, if you're going to like, uh, if you're going to treat me like a, like I'm a spooky Muslim, then let's like, let's do it. <laughs> okay. Right. So I have a couple of questions with Melissa. I, I, I find one, uh, they're, they're both great, but one of them is really also uh, hits uh, on a note for me. Growing up, what stereotypes do you remember being most asked or assumed of you? <laughs> I think, I think one both. of the earliest stereotypes that I just kind of went, huh? Was that I was going, that I was uh, uh, going to get an arranged marriage or that I, that I was already like in an arranged marriage. And I'm talking like when I was 10, you know, 10, 11. And uh, it's, <laughs> I, I mean, <sighs> very dumb, but uh, what can you do? I mean, like, the, you know, for a lot of people, I was um, just, you know, the only brown guy they knew, and I'm barely brown. Like, I'm, you know, I think that <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm white passing in a lot of like circles when I travel. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I was the brown guy. And what what did they know? You know, they knew uh, Apu and Ahasapima Petalon, mm -hmm. and, um, and they knew about arranged marriages. And, you know, that kind of like conflation of the so-called Muslim world, there's a word for it, it's Orientalism. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, people growing up in, uh, in Northern Alberta, like it's, it's, not, it's not the most worldly place or cultured place. And I had my own stereotypes about people of, of other cultures. So, I mean, I think that that was like one of them. The one though that, that has followed me, um, probably, you know, followed me the longest. And the one that I grapple with the most is the stereotype of abuse of Middle Eastern men. That's, mm -hmm. that's the one that like really like gets me. Um, and that, that has come up, you know, uh, you know, before, before I was married, it would come up with, with ex-girlfriends. It came up with my, my now wife, when we started dating where people would sort of like warn her or mm -hmm. kind of, you know, uh, straight up say like Middle Eastern men don't know how to treat their treat their women, which is a quote, by the way, but um, and a very <laughs> problematic one at that. But that's, you know, that's one of those things that it's uh, it's really internalized and it looms over me. And I feel like, you know, if I if say I have a, a, a disagreement or, or uh, frustration with with my partner in uh, in a in a public setting or something like that, I'm very conscious of how people will perceive that. I don't feel like I can, I can act authentically because of how people see it. So I think that's, that's probably the, the biggest right. one. I mean, that always reminds me of the, of the double consciousness, like you're, you're yes. conscious of your yes. own and then of your own, the perceptions of you outside. Very okay, very so getting a message, we have only one question. So I'm gonna, there's um, a very general one for you. Uh, can you tell us about your next projects, whether you're working on another book, you're studying another book and maybe just a word or two about the, the Burger Baron documentary. I don't know how you go from one book to another because I I've, I feel like I need to put like a five year moratorium before I even get on to another one. Um, I know uh, my next my next project is actually sort of a continuation of uh, the Last Baron, which is this forty five minute documentary on CBC Gem mm -hmm. about um, sort of the unlikely connection between the Lebanese civil war and a rogue, rogue fast food chain in Alberta that uh, everyone uh, would recognize, uh, the Burger Baron, but outside of Alberta, you probably wouldn't. It's a really, really fascinating story. My parents owned a Burger Baron in, in High Prairie. Um, so it's also a very personal story as well. Um, and we have, a, there's just a lot more to the story than we were able to tell. So uh, that's, that's the next thing on my list is to turn it into a 90 minute feature film for the international market. I really want to get it into, there's a very interesting U.S. angle to it. And, um, but, but mainly I really want to get it into the Middle East. Like I want to get it uh, subtitled in Arabic and I want to, I want people in, you know, in uh, the Middle East and North Africa sure. to, to enjoy uh, this, 
this weirdly specific Canadian story that I think it, they'll it love. It doesn't get more Canadian than that. And, and, and I can still, I see the connection as well between history, um, sort of migrant history, Islamic yes. history, Arabic history, and, um, and again, Edmonton where- the we, hidden, uh, it's, the, it's the hidden influence of, hidden cultural influence of, of racialized people in right. uh, in Canada in North America yeah, so. um, and those you know those are the stories that I'm interested in right, right now so whatever the next book is I I can almost guarantee you it'll it'll be you know it'll be in that Something. wheelhouse well I can't wait to read your next book and I can wait to see the full length uh version of next uh, your, of the documentary Amar, thank you so much for oh, being so you. generous uh, with your thoughts and where your ideas and your writing, if, I know if for everyone watching this, this is an outstanding book. Um, and I, I, I strongly recommend you rush out to your uh, local bookstore or wherever you get your books from and, and, and buy it and start reading it. Thank you again, Omar. And, and I'm really conscious of time. So I'm gonna hand it right over to Sheila there. And thank you, Sheila. Omar, Kamal, thank you for this fabulous chat. It felt like we were eavesdropping on a conversation if you were both in a coffee shop just catching up. So it was warm and authentic That's and wonderful. Usual, I did most of the talking. That's, well, <laughs> that's okay. As that's you should point. when you're, you talk, are, when you're, you're talking about your book. That's right. Kamal, thank you for joining us tonight and introducing us to Omar and his book. It's always lovely to connect with you and I look forward to welcoming you back for your latest book. Thank you. Omar, I wish you all the best as you continue to do the launch and talking about your book with support from Jillian Lovick and the team at Simon Schuster Canada. Just in closing, I'd like to share a review of your book from author and journalist Rachel Giza. Mualim is one of Canada's most masterful nonfiction writers, and there's no one I'd rather follow on a journey like this across centuries, around the world, and into intimate corners of family and personal history. With the deep generosity of both intellect and heart, he offers a rich and complex view of Muslim communities and of his ever-evolving relationship to faith. Omar, thank you so much for visiting Kitchener Library and for tonight's glimpse into your personal journey and the stories and experience of others. And to tonight's, thank you. And to tonight's audience, thank you for choosing to spend your time with us and for your questions. One lucky viewer will receive a copy of Omar's book, and we will contact the winner by email tomorrow. I'd also like to thank Wordsworth Books for their ongoing support of our author events. Copies of Omar's book are in stock and they are kindly offering a discount if you mention attending this event. And as we do with all of our 85 Queen events, we will be posting this on the library's YouTube channel. So we invite you to share it with others. Our next 85 Queen event will take place on October 7th with Zoe Whittle discussing her latest book with Julie Lalonde. Thank you for joining us tonight. Have a great week. Good night and see you soon.